When Jesus comes into your life, you know what he says to you? The bad news is you can't live up to what I want you to be and what I want you to do. The good news is you don't have to. I'm going to do it through you, and I'm going to do it through it for you. I'm going to give you the power to live up to what I want you to be. So what I want to do today is deal as this series with three areas where we all need help, and I believe only God can give us the help that we need. Now, we're going to look at an area as we start off today where I believe everybody at some time or another needs help. I believe there are a lot of people right now, listen to me, you need help in this area, and yet it's the one that we're least likely to admit that we need help with. As a matter of fact, you would think when I tell you what the problem is, you would think that highly successful people never deal with this problem. You, you would think that highly successful people never need help in this area. I thought the same thing and still I did a little research. And then I read an article entitled, Why Highly Successful People Seek Therapy. And I was first of all amazed, why do successful people seek therapy? And then I learned that one of the five most common reasons why people who are highly successful rich, famous, go to counseling, get psychological help, and seek therapy. You know what the number one reason is? They said the number one reason. It's what's called imposter syndrome. I'd never heard of this before. The number one reason why rich, famous people go and get therapy and get counseling and get help is because they suffer from this syndrome where they feel they're still inadequate. They still feel like they're a failure. They feel like they're a fraud. They feel like they are a fake. I'll give you one example. Madonna, the richest female musician in the entire world, has a net worth of $800 million, been at the top of her profession for 30 years, the epitome of the world's definition of success, one of the most famous faces in the world, can't go anywhere without being recognized, still sells out arenas everywhere she goes. Here's what she said. I have an iron will, and all of my will is always to be to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. My drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre, and that's always pushing me, pushing me, because even though I become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. Madonna needs help with Madonna. And there are times that I need help with me, and you need help with you. Because we've all had those times in life where we feel like, I'm not good enough. I am a failure. I don't know why anybody would have anything to do with me. I don't even know why she married me. I don't know why he, has, he, he married me. I, I, don't, I don't even know. And, and we, 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 we get into this comparison game. Why can't I be like him? Why couldn't I climb the ladder like her? Why can't I be where this person is? You can go to bookshelf after bookshelf, and the shelves are lined with books on how to have a better self-image and better self-worth, how to feel better about yourself. The problem is this. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you do, it can be losing weight. It can be making money. It can be becoming famous. It can be plastic surgery. It can be photoshopping. It can be assertive training. But at the end of the day, you still don't feel good about you. You look in the mirror and you don't like who you see. And you are still a prisoner of what other people say about you and think about you. Here's what I want to share with you today. The problem is not on the outside. Your problem is on the inside. And what I want you to understand today is this. You will never see who you truly are on the outside until you know who you should be on the inside. And only God can help you see that.
Now, we're going to get some help today from the greatest source of all, which I believe is God's Word. And there are some words in a book that a man named Paul wrote to a church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago that really gives us the secret on how to have a good self-image and the real secret to having the kind of self-esteem that we all ought to have. So, if you brought a copy of God's Word or you want to look on something else, we're in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Don't, don't let that intimidate you. There are two parts to the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Go to the New Testament, hit Matthew, go east, you'll hit Ephesians. All right, you're in Ephesians chapter 1. Here's what you're going to learn. What you're going to learn today is until you see who you are, and you, you were always meant to be in God, you'll never be what you should be or created to be in this life. Now, I'm talking to two groups of people, and you both apply. You're a believer in Jesus or you're not. You're a follower of Jesus or you're not. It makes no difference. We all have the same battle when it comes to this self-image. We all have the same battle when it comes to self-esteem. And what you're going to find that Paul says today, he says to everyone, because what Paul is going to tell us is this, in Jesus Christ, I can be the me I was meant to be. In Jesus Christ, I can be the me I was meant to be. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. I know some of you are kind of thinking, wow, you're kind of going positive thinking on us today. That's kind of different. Well, what I love about the Bible is the Bible addresses everything. It talks about every single problem that we face. And, and as you're going to learn later on in this message, I face the same problem battling low self-esteem as many of you in this room, or many of you listening to me right now, are battling this very moment. And I have found, once again, the answer to the problem is found in God and His Word. Now, here's what we're going to learn today. There are three things that you need to do, we all need to do, and you can do, in order to be the me you were meant to be. Number one. You've got to recognize your position with Jesus. You've got to recognize your position with Jesus. Now, it's very important to note what we're about to read, Paul wrote to a group of people just like us, just run-of-the-mill, dime-a-dozen, everyday people in a church called Ephesus. And I want you to notice what he says to them. We're in Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice what he calls these people. He calls them, will you say that word with me? Let's say it real loud like you mean it. Saints. Okay, now I know so you sit down there, whoa, 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 time out. I'm no saint. I've heard many people, oh, no, no, I, I, I'm not a saint. All right, well, let me just kind of correct one thing. There's no special class of Christians who are saints. Every Christian is a saint, and every saint is a Christian. The moment you become a believer in Jesus, you become a saint. Now, I love to be called pastor. That's a biblical term. That's my favorite term. I really love to be called pastor. But if you were to come up after the message today and call me St. James, I'd have to accept that. Because that's exactly what I am. I am a saint. You are a saint. Because according to Paul, the only step you have to take to become a saint is to become a follower of Jesus, a believer in Jesus, and the cost is absolutely zero. As a matter of fact, I'll say something. I, I, I didn't ever know this. I, I really never knew this before. Did you know the Bible hardly ever refers to a Christian as a sinner? Over 200 times, here's how the Bible describes a Christian. We're holy, we're righteous, we're saints. Because as a believer, you're a sinner by activity at times, but you are a saint always by identity. Now, let me tell you why that's true. This is where you need to get your head straight. You are not a saint because of your performance. It has nothing to do with your performance. You are a saint because of your position. Everyone outside of Jesus is a sinner. Everyone inside of Jesus is a saint. So in other words, if you're a believer, you're a saint, not because of what you've done for God, but because of what Jesus has done for you. You're not a saint based on what you do, your performance. You're a saint based on what you, who you are, your position. So first thing you got to recognize is this. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are a saint saint. All right? So, number one, recognize your position in Jesus. Number two, realize your possessions from Jesus. 
realize your possessions from Jesus. Now, we live in a world, and you know we all do this, right? We compare ourselves, and the way we kind of measure our self-esteem is we kind of compare what we have with what other people have. So we look at the car they drive, and the house they live in, and the clothes they wear, and the jewelry on their uh, hands, and on their rings, uh, fingers, and, and on you know their body. And we tend to measure ourselves by what we have compared to what others have. That's why we always try to keep up with the Joneses, because we measure our self-esteem by what we have. Well, if you are a believer, I want you to listen to what we have in Jesus. Listen to this. This is amazing. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, has blessed, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, there are two words I want you to kind of put a circle around in that verse. One is the word has. And one is the word every. Now, I bet you've never thought about this before, but this is so important. We're not told that one day God's going to give us all that we need. We're not told that. We're not even told that God has given us some of what we need. Paul says, we have already been given all that God wants us to have in order to be what He needs us to be. Now, let me tell you why we kind of get this all confused. We think the greatest blessings in life are material. That's why, you know, we buy stuff, and we keep stuff, and we store stuff, and we have stuff, because we think the greatest blessings in life are, are, are material. Let me prove to you why they're not. The reason why I know that the greatest blessings in life are not material is because you're either going to lose them or you're going to leave them. One way or the other, you're not going to have them forever. Somebody else is going to have them. Somebody else is going to live in your house. Somebody else is going to drive that car. Somebody else is going to wear your clothes, okay? You're either going to lose them or you're going to leave them. The greatest blessings in life are spiritual because you never lose them and you never leave them and they're found in Jesus. So think about this. You don't need, think about it now, you don't need what you already have. I think you'd agree with that, right? You don't need what you already have. And in Jesus, you have all that you need. You've got all the love that you need. You've got all the patience that you need. You've got all the peace that you need. You've got all the joy that you need. You've got all the goodness that you need. I'm going to give you a very radical thought. And this really, I had to change my thinking when I, when I read this verse. How often do we find ourselves asking for things that we already have. I mean, you, you know, think about it. We don't need as much as we think we need because whatever we need, we already have. Because once you realize what you have in Jesus, you quit asking for God's blessings and you start accepting God's blessings and applying God's blessings. So, for example, we've all done this at times. Lord, I need more patience. And God says, you have all the patience you need. I've already blessed you with it. Lord, I, 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 I need more peace. God says, I've already given you all the peace that you need. I've blessed you with every blessing. Lord, I, I need more joy in my life. God says, I've already blessed you with all the joy that you need in your life. Now, let me just stop. Call time out. I know, because if I were sitting in your chair, I'd be kind of a little skeptical too. I know you're sitting there going, I'm not buying that. I, I, no, 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 no. That's, that's positive thinking on steroids. I, 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 I'm not going there. I'm going to prove it to you. The moment that you give your life to Jesus, He gives you everything you need. Now, I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. When you give your life to Jesus, do you get Jesus? Yes or no? Okay, so you give your life to Jesus, and you get Jesus, okay? Okay. When you get Jesus, you get everything that Jesus has, yes or no? All right. So here's my last question. What does Jesus have? Everything. So this is what you just told me. When you gave your life to Jesus, you got Jesus. When you got Jesus, you got all that Jesus has. And what does Jesus have? He has everything. A woman walked into a bank one time, sat down, she said, she said the banker said, ma'am, how can I help you? She said, I'd like to open up a joint bank account. Oh, he said, that's great. He got out of form. He said, now, who would you like to open that account with? She said, a millionaire.
When you become a follower of Jesus, you open up a joint account with Jesus. You draw on all the resources that He has. So He's greater than the greatest. He is richer than the richest. So guess what? For your grief, you've got His grace. For your problems, you've got His wisdom. For your strength, you've got His weakness. For your needs, you've got His provision. For your sins, you've got His forgiveness. See, we think our problem is we just don't have what we need, when the real problem is not that you don't have what you need. The real problem is you don't realize you've already got it. All you've got to do is appropriate it. All you've got to do is simply apply it, because you can have it and get it anytime you want to. I, I'm, let me give you a good example. There's so many of you, you may be a follower of Jesus, you may not be a follower of Jesus right now, and here's why you've never become a follower of Jesus. Because of the very issue we're talking about right now, you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I tell you why I'm not a follower of Jesus? I can't even be a good me. I can't even get my own life together. I feel terrible about me. I can't even live up to my own standards. Now you're asking me to try to live up to the Christian life? You're asking me to try to live up to what Jesus wants me to be? I can never, ever do that, really. Well, let's listen to something else that a disciple named Peter wrote. Peter said, His divine power, that is God's, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. When Jesus comes into your life, you know what He says to you? The bad news is you can't live up to what I want you to be and what I want you to do. The good news is you don't have to. I'm going to do it through you, and I'm going to do it through it for you. I'm going to give you the power to live up to what I want you to be. I mean, you, you think about this. I know some of you think, gosh, I've never heard this before. I've never heard the fact that God's already blessed us with all the blessings that we need to be all that we want us to be. I, I, that's such a, Pastor, thank you for such a new radical thought. It may be radical. I wish I could take credit. It's not new. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So what are you talking about? I want to read a verse of Scripture. I bet you're like me. I bet you've read this verse hundreds of times, and you've never seen something in this verse. Watch this. Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We got that down, but then we don't kind of, we kind of skip over the next four words. Read these with me. And God, really? Question. Did Adam and Eve ask God to bless them? No. Did Adam and Eve, had, at that moment, had they done anything to earn God's blessings? No. At that moment, had they done anything to deserve God's blessings? No. God, He had barely put a breath in them, and He says, oh, by the way, I blessed you with every spiritual blessing. I bless you. Because God doesn't bless us because of what we do for Him. He blesses us because of what Jesus has done for us. All right, so pop quiz, okay? Everybody ready? You're a follower of Jesus. Ready? Everybody ready? You're a follower of Jesus. What is your position right now? You are a what? Yeah, you're a saint, okay? Now, I know for some of you are going, gosh, I just, I, I just find that hard to call me a saint. Can I be honest? I'm not going to tell you who. Some of you, I find it hard to call you a saint. We're just going to leave that aside, okay? But you are a saint. That is your position. God's declared you righteous, all right? Then realize your possessions. How many spiritual blessings do you have? All of them. You've got every spiritual blessing. God has emptied His treasure chest of every spiritual blessing so you can do anything He wants you to do, and you can be everything He wants you to be. Now watch this. Once you realize your position, man, I'm a saint. And once you recognize your possessions, man, I've, why would I compare what anybody else has with what I've got? I've got every spiritual blessing in Jesus. Then you can revise your perception in Jesus. Now you know and why to change your mind about the way you've always seen yourself. And in case I haven't still convinced you, listen to what else Paul says about those of us who are followers of Jesus. Listen. 
even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Now, you listen to what Paul says. Paul says, here's what God has done for you. He chose you He loves you. He saved you. Now here's the coup de grace. Here's the the cherry on the cake. He adopted you. He made you one of His own children. Now let me tell you what, what that means, okay? If God's chosen you and loved you and saved you and adopted you, I think we're safe to say that God has accepted you. And what's the one thing we are all born with from the time we come out of our mother's womb? We have this desire to be accepted. We all wanted to be a part of the in crowd. So we all wanted that emblem on our shirt just like the cool kids wore. We all wanted the same shoes that the cool kids wore. We always want to be invited to the party that the end kids were invited to be. You know, you know why? Because the one thing we feared more than gr- growing up than anything else, we feared rejection. We feared being on the outside looking in. Now, I want you to listen carefully. This is so important. Because of Jesus, God has accepted us. Because of Jesus, God has accepted us. You know what that means? That means you can't do anything so bad it would make God love you less, and you can't do anything so good it would make God love you more. He just loves you the way you are. He accepts us just as we are. Now, here's the good news. Because of Jesus, God has accepted us for who we are. Then He changes us into what we need to be. And let me just tell you, while I've been, I I was pumped about this message. Couldn't wait to dictate it fast enough in my study weeks ago. Because there was a time in my life I struggled with self-esteem. I mean, I struggled big time. You say, well, but you, you don't see me. You, you don't see the physical imperfections that I was born with. I'm not the best-looking guy, and I'm not the most beautiful girl. And, and, and you don't see the fact, as a lady told me a while ago, I didn't even finish high school. You, you don't see that about me. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't see the way in all the times in my life I blew it here and blew it there and all the opportunities that I threw away. And I mean, you could go on and on. You can give me all of your laundry list. I, I, I get that. I understand it. Here's what I want to say to you. If you live your life looking in a mirror, you will never see yourself the way you really are. If you live your life worried and fretting over what other people think about you, you'll never see yourself the way you really are. But when you look in this book and you listen to what the God that made you says about you, and you listen to what the God that made you says to you, and you believe it's true, then you will know then who you really are. I'm a saint that God loves so much. He has emptied His treasure chest of blessings so that I could have everything I need to be what I need to be and to do what I need to do. And I have been completely and totally accepted by the Creator of this universe. And in Jesus, that's who you'll be. That's what you'll have now and forever. Hello, my name is James Merritt, and I'm so honored to be speaking to you right now through Kingdom Set. If I could have just a minute or two of your time, I want to ask you a very important question. Does mankind need a Savior? It's a profound question. But the answer starts with an understanding of the character of God. I believe that God is all merciful, 
but I also believe that God is just. God created a perfect world for Adam and Eve, which is a true act of mercy and kindness, and yet they rebelled against it and disobeyed His direct commands. Now, I believe God can absolutely say to us, you're forgiven, which will satisfy His mercy. However, we must now deal with the justice of God. God is just, and He will punish wrongdoing. There's a price to be paid even though God's mercy is willing to set us free from our sin. But how can we pay this price? How can you and I ever truly satisfy the wrath of God with just words and deeds? This, I believe, is the unsolvable dilemma we find ourselves in here on earth. Yes, we can rely on God's mercy, and I believe He is merciful, but we can't satisfy God's wrath. That's why we need a Savior. We need God to be willing to become a human being just like us, while at the same time remaining fully God. You say, why? Because only God can save us. This God-man is the only person who could ever pay the full price of your sins and my sins. Throughout history, there's only one person who's ever lived that met that criteria, that was fully God and fully man at the same time, and that person is Jesus. The Scriptures say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Abraham was taught this by God and was willing to sacrifice his own son, but God stopped him at the last second. However, blood was still needed, and God in His grace and mercy provided a ram to Abraham. God, because of His great mercy and kindness, has provided to us the blood of Jesus to pay the price for our sin. Jesus willingly gave His blood to all mankind when He bled and died a horrible death on the cross. He died for you and for me. And He did so, not only out of His great mercy, but also to fully satisfy the punishment that we deserve. Well, you may be asking, well, <clears throat> how do we know that Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time? Well, we all agree that Jesus was fully man. He lived just like we did. He died just like we did. He got tired like we did. He spoke to countless people. His life is documented in the Bible and in the Quran. But we also know that Jesus was fully God because He did two things that only God can do. His incredible miracles, and He died and rose again to live forever. There are stories of people who died and were raised from the dead, such as Lazarus, but they all later died and were buried again. Only Jesus was raised from the dead to never die again. Every other prophet who has ever lived has died. But Jesus predicted He would die and rise again, and as a true prophet, He did exactly what He predicted He would do. Furthermore, He was worshipped by His disciples and others. And you know what? He accepted their worship. We all agree only God should be worshiped. Mankind needs a Savior, and the good news is the Savior has come. His name is Jesus. He came for you. He desires to know you, to love you, and to save you once and for all. If you want to connect with someone who can help answer your questions and to give you more information about what you've just heard, look for the number on the screen related to your country and call that number right now. I promise you this will be the best call you'll ever make. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you and keep you.